Hello, everybody. Come on, come on in. We'll be joined with our co-host, Sean, in just a second. But you guys know me. I am Jay, and I'm here with the lovely Libba. How are you today? I'm wonderful. Thank you, Jay. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Doing good. Just out here living. <laughs> same. Same, girl. Same. Yes. So, you know, I want to get started and whatnot. I don't want to hold you up too long. So let's just start off with a little bit of who is Libba? Okay. So Libba. <laughs> so obviously I'm the first woman eliminated from Ready to Love DC. I wear that title proudly. Um, but I am actually from the DC metropolitan area. I grew up here in Prince George's County, in particular in Fort Washington, as well as in Southern Maryland and Waldorf. I represent both. Um, all of my family is from this area um, in the Washington, D.C. area, primarily um, D.C. And um, I am 45. I'm a professor of marketing. Um, I'm a divorcee. So I've been I was married for about 20 years or so. And um, I am single and ready to mingle, honey. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And now I'm a name person because I have my actual government name is a very unique name. And yes. Libba is very unique. What yes. does it stand for or is it short for anything? So I am actually, I'm so glad you asked that. I am named after my great, great grandmother um, who was a folk singer. Her name is Elizabeth Cotton, but her stage name was Libba. And my parents named me after her. And so we in my family, we call her Granny. So Granny um, actually won a Grammy. Um, she started playing the guitar at a, a late age. She has a Grammy. Her guitar is um, in the Smithsonian. Um, she was known for playing the guitar left-handed upside down. And um, actually, Jimi Hendrix's guitar is next to my great grandmother's name. So I'm named after Libba. Yes. Nice, nice. So did you get any of the musical inheritance at all? Girl, I got some of it, but I lost it. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when, you know, so growing up, I used to sing, I used to sing competitively. And when you don't use it, you lose it. And I, I just lost all of it. So now all I do is sing in the shower or in the car and I won't do karaoke <laughs> or anything like that. But yeah. So this is Sean. Sean. Hi, Sean. <laughs> hey, Libba. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Same here. Same here. Welcome to another round. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, yes. So, yes, yeah, so we were just getting to get, get to know Libba a little bit. And so Libba just got through introducing herself. And I had to ask her, of course, where her name come from, because it is such a unique name. And she has a beautiful story behind it, which is lovely. It's from her grandmother, who was also in the in the musical arts. So yes. <laughs> it's a legend. She actually just was um, inducted into the Grammy Grammy Hall of Fame this year. So legendary yes. folk artist. Yes. Awesome. Oh awesome. It's so funny. Musical too, roots, huh? Yeah. yeah. And, and all day long, I've had Janet Jackson in my head singing Libba Nation for because <laughs> of your, your IG name. Oh, girl, I need to do a remix. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, I got off my first question. You want to go ahead and shoot her the second? Sure. So, you know, um, Libba, you know, you might not know me. Uh, but I'm always, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a locked and loaded kind of guy. So I just go straight, you know, go straight in and I don't want to waste your time. I know you are busy and you know, you got a lot going on. So there's a couple questions that I'm curious about. Um, as we've kind of seen the cast and we, we, it seems like a lot of people aren't really from the DMV area. Um, are you from DC? Uh, I don't know if Jay got into that. Did you notice that as well? that um, a lot of the cast members really weren't from the DC area? Yes, so I actually am a native, not a native Washingtonian, although I was born at Washington Hospital Center. Um, I was born in, well, I was born in DC, but raised in Prince George's County in Fort Washington, um, in particular Apple Grove, hey y'all. Um, and then I moved later on um, 
to Waldorf. So I went to high school in Waldorf. Um, and so, but the majority of my family is from DC. So I would go see my grandmother who lived in Northeast um, near, Art, um, near Carroll High School um, off of Hawaii Avenue. So in a lot of my family, just about, I would say 98% of my family is here in the DC area. So I'm a home girl. I love go-go music. I love mambo sauce sometimes on my <laughs> and all my fries. You know, I know about all the malls. I know about, you know, all things old school, go-go Mickey t-shirts, all of that. So, um, in fact, I did a lot of videos here recently on TikTok, just honoring the DC metro area. Um, in terms of my castmates, so what I did anticipate, because DC is a transient area, I anticipated that we would have like a lot of transplants. Like that, that's no surprise because a lot of people, they go to college, they go to Howard, they go to Bowie State, they go to you know UDC or Georgetown and they stay here. So I anticipated that. Um, but what I will say is that I was surprised that there was not one brother from DC. You know, and so for people who are here from the area, it's something about an uptown brother that's different from someone from southeast or southwest versus, you know, northeast, northwest. They're all wonderful. But um, just to be able to understand the culture and then also to have relatives who work for Metro, who work for the federal government, who work for, you know, some of these nonprofit organizations to be able to have like those types of conversations. Um, I didn't have the chance to do that. But. I do understand why they selected the castmates that they did. So I'm not going to take away from it. My thing is, is that they live here now. There was something about the DC metropolitan area that they love, that they decided to stay, that they had sought out love. And I ain't mad at them for it, you know, and we're not responsible for who gets casted, obviously. So, right. yeah. Okay, did I you <laughs> you did. You did. You, you did. <laughs> did you get shocked when you got casted? Um, I was shocked, but I was so grateful. So my experience, you guys, and I know I sound kind of um, optimistic because I am, but my experience has been fantastic. So from the interviewing process to even having the courage to apply and then to be selected and to go through all these different rounds of interviews and you go through psychological tests and things of that nature. So like the anticipation of whether or not you're going to be selected is pretty exciting. But then to be selected, it was like, my goodness, you know, here I am finally, um, having like a job interview of some sorts and being accepted for who I am, you know, where I can curse, I could be crazy, crack some jokes, you know, be myself. And then they appreciate, you know, me as who I am. So it was a, it was a fantastic experience for me. Nice. Nice. And so what is dating life in DC? So it's hard. It's been, so it's been tough because of the pandemic, you know, so we just recently was able to go outside per se, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of things have been restricted. They just started opening up nightclubs and you know, still there's some places that are only at 75% capacity. So it's harder dating here in the DC metro area. And then we've all gotten comfortable being home. Like sometimes we don't even wanna go outside, you know? So it's been tougher uh, dating in the DC area. I don't do online dating. Um, I didn't like it. I felt like I was objectifying men and I just didn't feel like that that was my thing. I wasn't able to connect with a lot of people that way. I just didn't feel comfortable. Um, but I definitely feel like this is a great place for people of color. Um, we do like a lot of lounges, a lot of, you know, day parties things of that nature, that's always a great way to, to meet people. Um, so I've had great, I've had luck, you know, in the DC metropolitan area. It's just that um, the numbers are kind of low <laughs> and harder to get to, so. So when you, um, so you had luck in the DC area, but of course COVID kind of shut some of the luckiness down. Is that part of what led you to come onto the show or this was kind of pre-planned prior? No, it wasn't pre-planned at all. It was, um, so I was in a relationship, um, had ended up, I was in a five-year relationship um, that did not work out. And, um, you know, I loved watching the show. I've been watching the show since season one. And I was 
I've always thought if I'm single and they come to the DC area, I am going to go and audition for this show. Um, partly because I love this area. There's something about DC. There's something about the black people that are here. You know, like for instance, Prince George's County, you know, we have the highest, um, the highest number of educated and affluent African Americans per capita throughout the whole entire country. You know, and so I was raised in that particular area. So I was excited to be able to connect with men and women, you know, um, to, to represent this particular area. So that was the primary reason. And then also knowing that they, my numbers will be better. Like they're gonna, they will weed through some of all of that. They do, we do psychological tests, you know, <laughs> they try to find, you know, some of the creme de la creme. And, and I was hoping that um, I would be lucky in love when ready to love, so. So dating Libba, what is that like? <laughs> oh my gosh, dating me. So obviously I have a lot of energy. I'm a lot of fun. I'm sarcastic as all get out. Um, I am pretty down for being spontaneous. And, you know, if you want to go out to eat, I'm down for that. If you want to, you know, dancing, uh, drinks, what have you, I'm, I'm pretty open to it. I'm a little old school, um, so I don't mind texting. Uh, but my preference is still to talk on the phone. You know, I, I enjoy that conversation. I enjoy hearing a man's voice. I enjoy hearing that laugh and we're flirting a little bit. And, you know, you can, you can um, understand a person more when you have the opportunity to talk to them. So I'm a talker, um, but I'm also, I can text. I'm good with that too. And um, yeah, I think that I'm a, I'm a fun date. Uh, I'm also, I have great discernment. And so sometimes, you know, early on, I can tell whether or not, yeah, this is just, you know, a playboy or uh, or mm, maybe he's not ready or, or what have you. But it takes a little bit of time. And that's the that's the beauty of, you know, having those types of conversations. So. So I got a quick question for you, um, and this is something that comes up a lot of time um, as we do reviews of certain reality shows, especially the dating and marriage ones. You talked about the the psychological test that they do. What are some of the questions that they ask if you can remember, you know, when they, you know, were doing that screening part of it? Ooh, okay, so there is more than just one aspect of the psychological question. So there was this one um, where we had to take like a, a test on a computer um, that was like almost 600 questions. Yes. So I don't remember any of those questions, Sean, uh, <laughs> at all. Um, but in terms of we had to meet with a psychologist and, you know, for the most part, they were asking us about our background. You know, if if we where did we grow up? Did we have both parents? Um, how was that? Was there like any traumatic, you know, childhood trauma? You know, those types of questions. I don't remember any I gotcha kind of questions, but um, essentially what they can do is deem whether or not you will be, whether or not you're healthy enough to be um, on a show such as this, whether you can handle pressure, I would imagine. And then if you do have any psychological issues, you know, so I don't remember everything, Sean, but like I said, that, that one questionnaire was about almost 600 questions, so. That, that was good, you know, because at least that gave us some insight into like the process, because sometimes we're like curious. We'll see like people, you know, do certain things and we're like, was there a screening? You know, um, so we, we were just curious. But 600 questions. Wow. That sounds like that was like hours and hours. You're sitting there taking taking an exam. Yeah, it was it was definitely I want to say maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Um, my eyes were crossing. You know, and, and with any of those psychological tests, they they pose the same questions in different ways too. You know, so it's like it really does detect whether or not you're lying or if you're fabricating the truth or you know exaggerating or what have you. Um, but yeah, it's a very thorough process. They also do um, a background check on you. Uh, they they check references. There were probably I probably went through about four or five rounds of interviews. So it's a very, very thorough process. 
Excellent. So they are they're doing their job to to vet people, which is uh, I'm assuming why it would also be good where, you know, someone like yourself would would consider coming on a show and be on a platform like this. Now, did you reach out to them or did someone reach out to you and saw your you know, your your profile? No. So my pro listen, my little Instagram is so little like I had been off of Instagram for about five years or so. So I think starting out, I had 300 followers of people who were not tired of looking at me. Um, so, <laughs> um, so no, I sought them out. I applied. They didn't seek me out. Now I know that sometimes they do, they will seek out people based off of like their profiles and things of that nature. But, um, I sought them out. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, coming to the show, we see the guys first day in. Was there anybody or anybody's that were on your top? No, not really. So let if and if I can just explain a little bit, you guys. I think because I'm a little bit different. Um, I definitely felt that there were some attractive men that were there. So I felt that Walter. I felt like almost. I felt like all the men were attractive in their own right. You know. So I saw Walter. He was the first man that I, I literally saw. And he's a good looking man, debonair, nicely dressed, smelled good. You know, I saw like a Dante and a Carrington and, you know, even um, Corey. They all present very well in person. So um, but here's the thing is I'm 45. I'm 45. My son is in college. Um, the majority of the men are in their 30s and then maybe early 40s. They've never been married or either they've never been married, they don't have kids or it's a combination thereof, right? And they all want kids, all of them. Well, here I am, 45, my child is in college and I don't know about you all, but you know, once you pass certain, <laughs> certain phases in life, like, woo, that's done. Good job, Liv. Your baby is out. You, now it's time for you to live your life, travel a bit, you know, think about retirement, do your own damn thing, right? So I felt like early on, maybe within an hour, um, a couple of things. One is, is that I didn't really feel a connection. I'm the type of person that makes immediate connections and have chemistry almost off the bat. I didn't feel that. Um, the mixer is chaotic, so people don't understand that. So the mixer started... Um, we got there like at 11 o'clock. I didn't get to the mansion until about two. And then I left probably after 1 a.m. And between all of that is filming. So you have about over 12 hours of filming that you have to condense down to about 46 minutes. On top of that, you have 20 people who are trying to meet one another. So there's always overlapping. Like, I can't get to this person because he's talking to this person. Or now you got two people talking to one person. So it's really, really hard trying to make connections, right? So, <laughs> so I just want you to keep that in mind because a lot of people don't understand. Even with the editing, you might hear bits and pieces of stuff, but that's certainly not the whole conversation. And that may be a, a, a bite from a whole different conversation with a whole nother person. So anyway, for me, I just felt like um, there were a lot of young men and there were a lot of men who wanted children. And I am at a different phase in my life. And on top of that, I can't have kids. I had a hysterectomy. So like the notion of me even having IVF or anything else, that's off the table. So I, I certainly did not want to um, pursue someone that I wasn't interested in. And on top of that, I really felt like that there were other women that were much better fits for those men than me. And so my, I think I felt more of a friend connection with just about all of the men um, and I was cool with that. I was fine. And that's why if you notice on the episode, I was like, the men got it right because they did. <laughs> they really did. Thought you was about to say something, Sean. You look like you was. <laughs> I was, but, no. but I was like, I was trying to say, uh, were you going to jump in? Um, no. <laughs> my question was, did in, in the early part of the process, did they, um, did the Ready to Love production stuff, did they know that about you and where you were? Um, in your in your sort of dating life and what you were looking for? 
Yeah, they knew. Um, so a lot of, of my story was not included, Sean. So um, so they knew that I had, you know, they knew about my marriage. They knew about um, my inability to have kids. Like I talked about that quite a bit. Um, I also talked about the fact that I'm a breast cancer survivor. Wow. Um, so I've ta I talked about all these different things that weren't included. But again, you got 46 minutes <laughs> to get everything in. So I'm not, I ain't mad at nobody. It's just, it's just that my story wasn't fully told. And as a person, the first person eliminated, why would they tell my full story? Right. Um, so they did know that, but I also believe because I have this youthful and young spirit that they probably felt like, you know what, this person might be a good mix or good fit for Libba, or perhaps that's not, you know, perhaps that's, that wouldn't be a, a, an issue for it, for this person. But, um, yeah, they, they certainly knew about it, but they don't cast people based off of other people. So please understand that too. You know, you get what you get when you get it. Okay. No, that's good. And listen, I got to say 45, uh, we wouldn't know if you, if you didn't tell us, you know what I mean? Like you definitely, you. you look Seriously. great. So, um, From all know. around your energy and your looks like all of, all of the above. Y'all, and if y'all knew what I've been through, like I, if you knew all the health challenges and all the times that I've almost passed away, like that's part of um, what's interesting, you know, part of what was mentioned in my elimination was that I'm too bubbly. And one thing that I will never apologize for are my positive attributes. I have been through so much. And so for to say that I'm bubbly or too light or whatever, I will take that because I've been through hell and back and I'm still looking like this and I'm still positive and I know that I'm still highly favored. Okay. So Amen to that. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. And you shout know, out to, to, to Breast Cancer Awareness Month too. So, you know, I heard you say you were a survivor, yes. you know, um, excellent. We're so, um, you know, so, so glad to still have you here with us and to tell your story and to have that light that, you know, clearly radiates around you. So yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And if I can just touch on that really quickly, because I actually had stage zero breast cancer. And so most people don't even know what a stage zero breast cancer is. And as a black woman, I was diagnosed when I was 38 um, out of just sheer happenstance. I felt like a lump when I had on a jacket and I was like, I need to go see a radiologist right away. I went, that lump was nothing. Like that was just a regular old, you know, um, lump that women get, you know, month to month. But what they detected was calcifications within, you know, my left breast. And when calcifications are clustered, it's a sign of, you know, stage zero breast cancer. And I saw it right away. I was like, oh snap, I got cancer, you know? So, but when black women under the age of 40 um, develop cancer, it can be highly aggressive. And so they were mm -hmm. telling me that if I did not get diagnosed when I did, I would have had stage stage four breast cancer two years later. So won't he do it? Won't he do it? Yes, yes. he will. Yes. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. And again, like I'm gonna say, I know a lot of people did say your your energy is bubbly and stuff. I kind of enjoy it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I rather enjoy the energy because it brings my energy up even more. So, <laughs> and I, and I know that was, that was the weirdest, I don't know how Sean felt, but it was the weirdest reason for it eliminating somebody to me. But for me, it didn't seem like your energy matched anybody's energy there, or that's still there at all. Anyway, I didn't see anybody. Everybody was kind of calm. Yeah, I think that it's more about like, I, I have a lot of energy. I know that, you know, some people are, um, they withdraw for someone like me and that's cool. You know, they can't, they, some people are slow to warm up. I'm more like, bam, hey, how y'all doing? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, but I'm a people person and I know who I am and I can pull back a little bit. I'm very good at reading people too, but I think that again, I probably gave more of a friend vibe um, at the mixer because I'm like, mm, I can also detect, okay, that's a player. That's someone who has some work to do. You know, that's someone that maybe I need to go back to, but you know, then we have like a lot of vegetarians, honey. I love pork chops. 
I love some other pork chops. I want some ham on my plate at Thanksgiving. Okay. So like there are certain things in my, that I was like, all right, well, I can work with a vegetarian. My ex-husband was a vegetarian, but girl, I did three different meals for damn near 20 years. I don't want to do that no more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but at the same time, I was still willing to listen, but I knew right on that there was those the other women who are beautiful. My castmates mm -hmm. are so dope, and I need people to understand that. That they, my castmates are dope. I understand why they were selected. Um, the women are bad. They um, they're very well accomplished, and you know, um, just good people. Same thing for the men. But sometimes what happens is is that you realize he's not that into me, and I'm certainly not that into him, and that's okay. That's no reflection of me. It's just that that's just not my man. That's not my potential boo. So that just brings me around to the scene with Carrington. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I am going to admit, I am one of these people that was like, okay, it was a little bit of an overshare the way it was shared on the tattoos and where they were and whatnot. Oh, <laughs> but I, the prank. Yeah. Oh, that was prank. I get them confused. I'm sorry. I'm going to be bad with this. All these bald head and beards and stuff. <laughs> Yes. I'm I know, Sean. Sean. I know. I'm Sean, not. you got the glasses, baby, though. I can tell you apart. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm glad yes. that you mentioned that because what happened was, what you don't see, is um, we were just having a casual conversation about tattoos. Mm -hmm. So they were both Frank and Aisha and myself, we were talking about tattoos. I didn't want to talk about where I had my tattoo. That was part of me like, uh, like I was like hesitant to mention that I had a tattoo above my booty and also, you know, um, on my upper thigh because, you know, I didn't, it's not a big deal or what have you, but it was just like, there was some hesitancy there. And then eventually I was, they were like, no, it's okay. Sure. I got one here. I got one here. You know, so I'm like, uh, okay, well I have it here. So yeah, there was a bit of oversharing, but that wasn't just on my part. We were all just talking about you know, our tattoos and our experiences and how many hours, you know, because that's what people who are tatted do. They talk about how many hours they've had covered. So, yeah. And you'll also notice that it was a lot of cut and paste. Did you see that? Like a lot of these weird noises, like I had Tourette syndrome. And I just was like, you know, it is what it is. I signed up for this. So I signed up knowing that product, everything that is filmed, they own. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever they want with it. So if I'm up there sounding like, you know, DJ hero, well, then that's what it is. Got it. So basically a bad edit. Okay. It does happen. It did happen. We did have a conversation. I did talk about where my tattoos were, but I was hesitant mm -hmm. and reluctant to say that, you know, like, uh, you know, and I do make weird noises. I exaggerate. I don't do it quite like that, but, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm quirky and I own it. I love it. No, nah, no, nah, don't get me wrong. I'm a shot and let you know, I could be an overshare myself. So, <laughs> so yeah. he knows me and whatnot. So I have no problem with that. It just, it was the editing of how it came about. Cause it did just seem like it was jumped into there and nobody else mentioned their tattoos or they barely, they barely went into the conversation. It was just like, Oh, I got tattoos. And it, here comes Libba. I got to hear. <laughs> That's how it right. went. So. Let me talk. Let me talk. <laughs> And I'm like, but meanwhile, I told all this story about me being a breast cancer survivor. I talked about, you know, having the courage to leave a marriage. I talked about, you know, trying not to let my child down. You know, I talked about all these things and about my journey and none of that was displayed. But again, they own everything. So I can't be too mad at it. You know, that's just that's that's just the chance that I had to take, you know. A hundred percent. Um, so I know there's certain things that you just can't say, but when, when did, do you know when the season actually, or when it actually, when you guys stopped filming? Um, well, I will say that it was the, you know, the end of the summer, um, was a lot of the filming, but we still have, um, the reunion to, to film. So, yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the next thing coming up. And have you been watching each episode? 
I sure have. I love my castmates. So whether I'm on there or not, I'm going to be rooting for them and supporting them. Um, I am a huge proponent of the show and I will be watching and taking notes and talking about it and kikiing it up with everybody else. Any any anything you've seen so far that's kind of like got your attention or like what the hell is that or you know anything that stood out to you? Um, other than not not necessarily, I think that um, I'm interested to see how things play out. I kind of see just going back to the casting special, um, just listening for keywords that were chosen for certain people. Um, I'm wondering how that's going to be selected so even with my casting special you know it just made me i felt like oh wow i just seem like this ditzy old horny woman <laughs> you know that's like out here looking for you know a play thing um but again and once i realized that i was like i wonder if that's how it's going to play out for me you know I said everything that I said. I meant everything that I said. But again, with editing and them having to condense it down, you know, they, they have a job to do. So I, I understand it. But nothing that necessarily stood out um, because I was there <laughs> um, for some of it. And then also, um, again, just befriending a lot of my castmates, just knowing like um, who they are as people. I will ask me like in two, three, four, five episodes, you know, but right now, I think it's pretty safe. So have you made any good connections with any of the ladies or the guys since the show? Like you guys still keep in contact? As oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we are a close knit group, you know, especially some of the the, the women um, I have. I feel like I have a, a really nice bond with Tasia. Um, that's my boo. Um, so is Aisha. So is Sabrina. So is Carrie. So is Courtney. Um, we've, we've done a really good job of staying connected. Um, I also have a lot of respect for, um, Mumin and Zadia as well as Camille. You know, we don't speak as frequently It's 10 of us. Jeez Louise, you know, we can't always be together all the time, you know, but, Sometimes you do develop chemistry with different people. Same thing for the men. You know, they're all they're all very respectful, um, and we make sure that we party together, um, kick it together. It's a it's a nice it's a nice crew. I feel like I have a family, and that was one of the things that I loved about the show itself was the camaraderie mm -hmm. and the sisterhood and the brotherhood among um, all of the castmates. And that's something that I really did want to achieve. And so I say this and I mean it, I was looking for love, but I found it, but it looks different. It looks a lot different than what I anticipated. And this feels really good. It really does. So did being in the bottom two with Tasia, did that forge that bond? or it formed afterwards? It formed afterwards, you know? So it formed, and it was beautiful about it. It formed so naturally, mm -hmm. you know? So all the all that we have, the bonds that I mentioned, we rarely talk about the show. It's about us getting to know one another and really, um, you know, appreciate each one of our journeys because this is some craziness. And we recognize that no one will understand all that we go through like us, period. No one, you know, a lot of people are judgmental. A lot of people will assume that, oh, they're looking for cloud. They wanna be, you know, all these opportunities. Libba, I came on here for love. I'm a professor, honey. I'm a professor. I don't have, I, I'm, you know, I'm not an actress. I'm not anything else. I'm just, you know, someone who was willing to take this chance. And if people have opportunities that come from this, I will not be mad at them for that. Not at all. Speaking of those opportunities, anybody jumping in your DMs lately or trying to uh, get to know you better? I need someone to jump in my DMs because I am still looking for love. Like, hook a sister up. Come see me. You know, pull up on me. I am single and ready to mingle. I'm serious when I say that I'm looking for my love. I'm looking for my forever. I want my forever to find me. So um, I have some, you know, creeps <laughs> in my DMs right now. Some of it's a little scary. Um, <laughs> It's weird. Some of it is weird. So I have to be careful, you know, in, in terms of the type of energy that I'm bringing towards myself. But that's why I said I mentioned to the aunties, to the cousins, to the sisters, even, you know, some of the boys like 
Holler at your boy. If you know somebody that could be good for me, you know, him that brother up and say, check out Lib because I'm looking for love. I am. I look forward to it. Yes. So for the fellas out there, please, if you're going to if you're going to come to Libra, come respectfully, you Thank know, you. don't be weird. You know, don't you know, she's she's a fun, you know, lighthearted spirit. But, you know, no, no, no random craziness, no stalker vibes. So, you know, just just a word of caution out there. Thank you, Sean. I need that because, you know, these men out here, honey, they want to send you stuff. And I, mm -mm, don't do that. Uh -oh. <laughs> No, that's not God. happening. I don't believe you know, it. Come, come correct. Don't come to me with some. No, no, no. I'm when, not, when they try to send you stuff, just send no them your cash. Pictures? Is that what you're trying to say? Listen, I am not oh, first man. here. Yes, I'm cool with Moline. I see somebody asking. I'm cool with all the women. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm cool with all of the women. I, I, I respect all the women on there. Um, uh, again, it's just that sometimes you just naturally connect to certain people. We all are great women. So, yes. Speaking of Momin, you met, um, you mentioned respect. And in the last episode, we saw Corey and her on that log and we were all cringing. But she <laughs> you <laughs> I'm not mad, sis. I'm about to pour another round myself. Because <laughs> even us as, even some of the fellas was like, whoa, that that was that was that was that was real awkward looking. <laughs> Listen, let me just tell y'all about Corey. Cause I he has a little special, I feel little Corey. He has a special place in my heart. And the, and the reason is is that at the mixer, so I had a lot of great interactions with people off camera, right? And on this show, anything off camera does not count. It don't count, right? But I'm out, it's hot as Hades out there. It's in, the, in July here in DC, which is brutal, right? It rained the day before. And so when Corey came, I was like, we should talk. He was like, are you hot? He was like, let me get you in the shade. He rearranged all the chairs for me and was like, you know, come on, let me let me take care of you. I was like, okay, take care of me. So then we end up, you know, <laughs> we ended up having like a really good conversation. But Corey is a unique, you know, quirky, um, eclectic individual, you know, and so to see him riding uh, attempting to ride that pony. I, I just was like, oh, <laughs> oh, look at Corey. He's trying, poor thing. He, the first king of dates. I Listen, I wonder what he rated this particular date. Um, so God bless Corey. And God bless Mumi. I thought she was going to break out in song or something. This is Pickles V. She said he's trying to ride that pony. <laughs> she Girl, said he, he was trying to ride that pony. And she was like, Petrified. I said, oh, Momine, poor girl. She did better than me. She was what out in the woods. I think that I would have, I would have did. <laughs> I would have strong down as that. You don't get up off of me. All we see is Corey flying off the tree. Oh, girl, God. Corey would have been <laughs> over the edge. That or. The other part of it, you know, depending, like if I liked him, I might have, see, I'm I'm not as sweet and as innocent as Mami, so I don't know what I would have did, you know, if I if I was digging him, but I certainly would not have reacted as gracefully as she did. <laughs> I and love it. Are, <laughs> <laughs> Libba said, I have done with enough creeps in my life. I will not do any more. <laughs> if you don't back up off of me, what you doing? Get your ass down. I would have been bleep, 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 all over the scene. Like, Libba, you can't curse that much on camera. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he would have deserved all of that smoke too. I would have given it all. There would have been a fire up in that daggone woods. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have been watching Lip of Barry Corey. <laughs> Girl, listen. And so let, let me just say this. My timing on the show was perfect, you guys. Perfect. Keep watching and you'll understand why. Each week it gets juicier and juicier. There's some things. There's going to be a lot of chemistry, a lot of heat. And I think for a grown 45-year-old woman such as myself, there's certain situations in which I don't need to be in. 
you know, and I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose who I am behind anything. I don't want to lose my temper. And that's why I didn't need to be on in the woods with Corey, you know, or anything like that, because y'all would have been like, what? what? Oh my, did y'all see Libba knock Corey over on TV? Like, we just didn't need that. It would have made good TV, but no, it we didn't. Made good TV, but that's not, listen, that we wasn't my purpose. That. We don't need Libba in jail. We wouldn't Girl, be having this conversation right now. I'd be like, yo, Libba is like Medea in real life. Like, y'all, no, I don't need that. No, we have a Medea. <laughs> So we know that you were uh, once married before. Yes. So how was that? And then how did it come to an end? Yes. So I got married at 19, very young. Um, I've always been an old soul, definitely in love. And I will say that I have much respect for my ex-husband. He's a great man. So I, I will never talk negative about him. Um, but I will say that getting married at a young age, sometimes what happens is you grow older and you grow apart. And so for us, we ended up growing apart. And as I mentioned in the show, we were sleeping in separate quarters um, mm -hmm. to the point where it was extensive. So he would be sleeping in one bedroom and I would be sleeping in another bedroom and not understanding why, you know. And at some point, my son, I think he was probably around nine. He had posed a question to me. Well, mommy, why do you and daddy sleep in separate bedrooms? And that killed me. And so for me, it was like, I did not, I didn't have an answer for him, you know, and um, I did not want to raise my son in a household that looked like that, you know, um, even if you try counseling, even if you try different things and it doesn't work, I did not want my son to grow up in a household where um, it demonstrates what love should not look like. And so I left my, my ex-husband and we I left him probably around year 13 or 14, and we were separated for quite a bit before we got divorced um, because of financial issues and because of the housing market and all kinds of stuff. So, But during that lull, during that period, I had the opportunity to find myself um, and just discover Libba as a woman. You know, what do I like? You know, what are men like? What does What's significant to me? I was able to get myself back on on my feet financially. That's when I got my education. I was able to afford my new home um, off of student loans, to be honest with you. Um, and so it took me a while to get back on my feet. But I think that I was so proud of myself for making myself as the priority because I was living my life for someone else and losing myself in the process. So it took a lot of courage to finally say, mm -mm, girl, you deserve better. And it was hard as a mother because I did not want my son to um, be a sacrificial lamb. You know, in the process, I had this healthy, happy child and I wanted that for him. I wanted my son to grow up in a two parent household. So it broke my heart in a lot of different pieces, but I knew that it was necessary for me to make that difficult decision for the sake of me and my son, so. Afterwards, did it make co-parenting better or was it still difficult? No, or we made a pact. No, no. So we took this thing very seriously. We did research. We tried to figure out like what's the best way to co-parent, what's the best custody plan for us. Um, we've stayed in close communication to ensure that we didn't get played by our son either. <laughs> But um, parent, we took parenthood very seriously because, um, again, that is my son is the biggest blessing and my favorite blessing ever. So we did everything that we could to ensure that he continued to live a healthy and ha happy lifestyle. So co-parenting, even to this day, you know, my son is in college, but we still have conversations about our son every now and again. So, no, I am not about the drama. I don't do that. And so, um, and neither did my ex-husband and, and that's why it worked so well. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Cause I have a similar situation and yes, we co-parent great now. Just wasn't married, but we do good job now and stuff. It takes and some work and it takes a lot of maturity, honey. And it takes you to put that ego aside mm -hmm. and do what's best for that child or for those kids. It's not about you at that point. It's about them. Yeah, and then we definitely had to keep close because I was like, she will try to play us. She'll try it. 
<laughs> Try to get and when you're in sync as parents, you be like, yo, he did not say that. Call mm -hmm. him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Call your daddy. Let me see. Uh -huh. Let me see. I already talked to him. We already had this discussion. You try to play somebody. You better go play Monopoly, girl. <laughs> so what is Libba looking for now at, in a man? What does he have to bring? Yeah. So I definitely, when I say a man of integrity, like I need a man who um, is a man of his word, who is um, someone who is secure in himself, who is kind, generous, who loves Black people, loves Black women, you know, who is respectful. All of the things that I want are basic types of things. You know, like I'm not looking for someone who's extraordinary. Essentially, I want someone who is loving and will love me all of me, all that I bring, you know, um, I don't necessarily have a type. I will say that I've had my fair share of narcissist and, you know, of, <laughs> of egotistical, you know, selfish people. I'm not doing that anymore. That's not something that I'm interested in. I just want all positive vibes, um, realistic, of course, but just positive type of people. I'm, I, I won't do narcissist. I won't do, um, alcoholics or, you know, cheaters or anything like that. That's not something that I'm interested in. I just want a good man. Somebody's great who can love the hell out of me. Any deal breakers in that? Deal breakers, narcissist. Um, I would say narcissist, cheaters, um, someone who has still has like trust issues and baby, either mama issues or daddy issues that they can never get over. Um, Trust issues is a major thing for me. If you can't trust um, or if you're always assuming the worst in people, um, that's not someone that I, I want to be around. Um, a cheater is also a, a deal breaker for me. Uh, but yeah, though, but again, those are basic kind of things, you know? Now, I think you mentioned you, you, um, you were in a relationship after your marriage for five mm -hmm. years. Yes. So... <clears throat> Uh, one of the questions from the audience is around, like, what do, what do you think you learn um, from that particular situation? Um, you know, and what, you know, like, what were the takeaways from that? Yeah. So here's what I learned from that situation. So after my marriage, I didn't think that I had the capacity to love again. I was like, at some point I was like, man, F love, F everything. And I'm a lovable person, but I was like, I didn't want anything to do with love. So the relationship that I was in, what it taught me was that I still had the capacity and capability to love. And not only that, but my love had become even greater, right? So that's one thing that it taught me and it never left me that love, no matter the circumstance, you are still worthy of love. Um, the other thing that I learned was that I reverted back. I had started making that person more of a priority than myself. Um, and um, that's something that I will never do again, where their needs meant way more than my own needs. And I knew it. And there were certain, sometimes I was even lying to myself, like as if I really wanted to be there, knowing that that was not where I needed to be. So it's more about self-awareness um, and that I still left there knowing that I have all this love to give and that I'm an outstanding partner. Um, I really am. And I, and I'm, I'm not saying that tooting my horn, but I know my worth and I know what I have to offer. No, that's, that's, that's excellent. Right. You know, just being able to assess the situation and see where you are. And if I'm, I'm hearing you correctly, it sounded like the, all the love you were giving perhaps wasn't being reciprocated back to you. Um, in a way that was fulfilling to you. And I think we talk about that a lot of times when we talk about the love languages and loving someone the way they want to be loved. So what? Um, how, how, how does Libba want to be loved? Uh, Sean, you hit it right on the head. Um, I'd certainly want that reciprocity. Um, I want to be valued and appreciated. I go all out for my man. Like I am, I am, especially not that I'm always looking for an alpha male, but I am an alpha female. And that's not because I want it to be. It's just that I have characteristics that deem me as an alpha female. But there's something about a man's man that 
I can turn into a little mess. Like I will be like, baby, what do you want to eat for dinner? Like I will take your plate. I will, you know, I do all of that, you know, and I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy catering to my man. And so for me, it's important for him to appreciate that and value all that I have to give, but then would turn around and do the same thing for me. Like, you know, and then I'm having a bad day, baby. I went in there, look relaxed. Here's a glass of wine. Let's turn some music on, rub my neck, my back, whatever. You know, like I, I want that. I want someone that if I'm having a hard day at work that I can shoot ideas to them. You know, um, someone who will love and embrace my son. And like that reciprocity is very important to me. Um, and that I want someone that both my parents would be like, Libba, that is an outstanding man. Like, and he loves you. I can tell by the way that he looks you in your eyes, you know? So, and I also want some, someone who, you know, there's a, a quote going around that you want to marry someone who wants to be a husband, not necessarily who's just looking for a wife, but someone who desires to be a husband, you know? And then the spirituality aspect is very important to me as well. I'm not necessarily looking for a religious man, but I certainly want someone who um, has an appreciation in a relationship with God somehow, some way, and that they operate in that way as well. So. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. And, <clears throat> you know, obviously we, we love that as men. Right. You know, that that catering, that that um, gentleness. Uh, it, it goes a long way, and 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 um, with the right man, obviously, that's going to bring the best out um, in us. So you know, hopefully, you 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 find that love out there because it, you know everything I'm hearing. Sometimes we have these discussions, and I hear some women are just in delusion city, and I'm like, okay, so you want what things, and how much money does he have to make, and he has to be six feet tall, and all of this stuff. But the things that you're saying um, all seem, you know, all seem tangible, realistic. And um, match the things that you're willing to give. So, so I love that. You know, it's so unfortunate. <clears throat> well, and, and then here's the thing. I know on the on the show, one of the things that it mentioned was that you know the tall thing. You know, the short brothers. Well, please understand that I'm five ten. So I'm five ten, and then in my heels, I'm like two, six two six three, and I wear my heels ninety eight percent of the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I was saying like no short men. And I'm not even saying no short men because I used to date, I dated short guys like that. That's no problem. But sometimes with shorter men, what I've noticed is that with that imbalance here, I am six, three and you're five, nine, you know, people are looking at us and looking at me or looking at him like, what are y'all doing together? You need to be a secure man, you know, secure enough to, to appreciate this big old tall glass of water next to you and not be intimidated by people's stares and things of that nature, you know, and then, and sometimes short, short of men, they've been teased growing up because they are shorter. I need someone who is secure in himself, who I feel like could chop down this cherry tree, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and that the security is not limited to just short men. I need a secure man. I don't need an insecure, jealous man. Jealousy is also a deal breaker for me. Um, jealousy is not limited to you thinking that someone is, you know, wanting me or whatever, but sometimes men also get jealous of your accomplishments or the fact that you are this positive person. They want to dim your light. And I'm not going through that. I don't, I don't want that um, in my life at all. No, I get that. Uh, wow. 5'10". I would have never guessed it. Yeah, He's 5'10", too. That's what <laughs> yeah. I said. I was going to say, you my East Coast twin right now. Like. Oh, yeah, girl, you're 5'10"? Yeah. Yes. All your jeans are high waters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of them growing up. All of them growing up. Made me real insecure because I was skinny with, with short jeans on all the time. Girl, me too. My inseam is like a 35 and a half. So I always, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mid-calf boots are my favorite. That's why I need to be on the East Coast. <laughs> I was like, shoot, I, I either I'm wearing pedal push or a capris because that's what all these pants is about to be at this point. I'm rolling them up at the bottom. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, my, my tall heels. So I know mm -hmm. that you relate to a lot that I mentioned then. Yeah, yeah. I've had my my share of some short men, but most of the ones that I've had never been insecure. So it's it was You've okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel weird. They didn't hang around, Jay. They didn't hang around. Huh? You got rid of them. 
<laughs> and here's the thing a lot of short men love tall women like they they look at you like with a lot of adoration you know look, so then they, they, like, they like climbing trees still they not they haven't grown out of that phase yet no <laughs> i mean and depending on the man you know you can climb this tree <laughs> so you did mention something on love languages or was sean mentioned people loving on love languages what would you say yours are so i did the, i did the test so I forgot how many love link there is access service. Five. There's mm -hmm. five. Okay. So then I tied four and then access service is my last one. So like, I was like, this is some weirdness. I didn't even know this could happen, but so <laughs> I do love physical touch. I love words of affirmation. Um, what else? Yes, yes. I think gifts. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I've never been one who's been spoiled but I spoil myself. So gifts, I guess is, you know, maybe the fourth, but, um, access service is my last love language, but it's the language that I'm probably very strong at. So the last in terms of me receiving it, but probably the strongest in which I give it because, um, I'm a giver. I'm a, I'm a huge giver in a lot of ways. So basically when you have your man, you revert from your alpha. Well, I don't really say you take away from your alpha role because I look at it sometimes like lioness. You know, we have our king and so he still is going to get served, but we still run everything underneath us. So Absolutely. that's how you basically saying that you treat your man. Once you have your man, it's here you are, baby. I got you. I got you. I got you. I love and... it. I love it. Like I, I want to be that support for that man, especially knowing that he's the protector. I'm not going to say the provider. I've never had a provider. It'd be nice, but I've never really had a provider in my life. I've always been kind of a provider, but um, I don't mind being submissive. A lot of women hate that term of being submissive. I don't mind it. I am strong all the time. I'm, a, I'm even strong in my submissiveness. So I don't mind supporting that man. Our black men need support, honey. The mm -hmm. world is out here telling these black men that they ain't nothing. They out here killing them and hating on them. And I feel like as a black woman and as a black mother, it is my responsibility to take care of that black man. And I take pride in that. So, yeah. Say it again. All right now. <clears throat> <laughs> Sean about to be over there. <laughs> Sean like DC not far from me. <laughs> hey Sean. <laughs> you saying all the right things, Lebus. Come on. It's true though. I mean, am I lying? We it's seriously no, our black men. Not. I mean, black men, women, we've known to be like the backbone. That's just something that we are. But our black men, we we have to be a support to them. We have to, Definitely. and we have to lift them because black women, we played the role of the head of the family in a lot of instances, but in order to elevate that man, to help him get to him to where he needs to be, we need to be that support system for him too. So yeah, I'm going to treat my man well. And, um, you know, at a woman who's in her forties, I know what the hell I'm doing, you know, and I enjoy it. So of course I'm going to be there for my man. So just a few last questions before we let you go, because we don't want to take up all your time. Uh -huh. So one, because um, we're big on this on the channel of going through your relationships, knowing your part in them. Uh -huh. When the, say either one of the relationships, you can choose either one of them, the five year or your marriage. Do you know your parts and why it might have come to its conclusion on your end? Or is Absolutely. it just all your partner? No, no, it's definitely, it's definitely partly me as well. I think that, you know, as a younger woman, being highly independent, you know, trying to, and I was, I've always been ambitious, always, always, always. So the role that I played was I, in some ways, took over, I'm not gonna say my role was a man, but I can understand if he felt like I had attempted to be the man of the household at some point. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with it. And that's why I don't have an issue at this point because I grew from that. That's why I wanna be that good support system. Um, 
but that and I, you know, at the time I was a know-it-all girl. You couldn't tell me nothing. You hear me? Like I thought I knew everything and and I knew a lot. I didn't know everything. And so and I've, I'm highly confident, too. So I speak with confidence. I was but I was still a very good support. And I want to say that, you know, there was some depression within my household that I did not know about, you know, so um, that had a lot to do with it. But I gave it a good try. Um, I gave it a really good try um, for this last relationship. Um, I think that I lost myself in the process and I had not spoken up on things that I knew that was not right. Um, and with toxicity, it isn't just one person, it takes two. And so at some point I have to take the responsibility of acting or, or being involved in, you know, um, some toxic type of things, not toxic, like Ike and Tina, but just like, you know, getting out of my own character because I didn't necessarily agree with my partners, you know, and I did not feel appreciated and I did not feel valued. And instead of leaving, I stayed. And I got mad at myself and I just became a different person in the process. So I learned a lot from it. But no, it's never always them. I have to take accountability because if I don't, what the hell, what have I learned? Oh, my favorite word, accountability. <laughs> no, I, 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 I really appreciate it. And I love hearing that when I, because not a lot of people, male or females, like to admit their half in the breakup of a relationship and stuff because i mean you know we all have our egos and we have our pride and we don't want to just say we like to sit in the victim role a lot of times and just say oh no it was the other person but we don't grow from those areas so mm -hmm. it's glad i'm glad to hear that you have grown each time to evolve yeah to the person and I'm a, much better, today. I'm a much better woman for it you know i'm a mm -hmm. mesh, i'm a much better woman for it and again why would you go through some things without learning, you know? Um, and for me to think that it was all them, that's delusional. That's delusional. <laughs> Sean. So I love that, you know, and, and, and I think that's going to be your calling card, right? Because that accountability that, uh, you know, to kind of reflect back on the roles that you played, in, in different situations and dynamics is key, right? Because that's what's going to position you to be, you know, better on, better down the line. So I love that you embrace that part of it. Um, Thank you. I have to. <clears throat> the, the last question I would have for you is, do you know how things play out in the end? Do you have the insight? I know you are not like technically, weren't technically on the show, but because of your connections, do you know how things end up? Not fully. No, I know some things, but I, I certainly don't know all the things. Um, yeah. Do you think we'll be surprised, shocked? Absolutely. Okay. Because I know I'm trying to I'm trying to be delicate because I know you can't say certain things, but. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna say you'll be shocked and you'll be um, a taken. You'll be taken back by a lot of things that will be forthcoming and not just the towards the ending, but just all together. You know, some good, some bad, some like, Lord have mercy. So yeah, it's gonna be when we talk about the fact that this is the juiciest season yet, it's no exaggeration, none. So we should stay tuned and keep you watching. To. <laughs> Honey, listen. <laughs> Y'all, y'all better start. Yes, stay tuned in. And I think that there are a lot of people who watch the show. They judge people. They say, and then there's some people like, well, what you going on the show for? You went on the show, blah, 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 blah. Listen, you, we go into the situation not knowing hardly anything. You know, you know that you're going on, go on TV. You know that people will probably criticize you. But all the other stuff, you have no idea. You don't know what to anticipate. So, what I say is, is that show some of these people some grace and mercy and understand that editing, again, hours and hours and hours of filming condensed down to 46 minutes. I'll say this one thing. God makes no mistakes. So for you leaving the show, I can see that that is not an issue. I really did appreciate your exit. It was a breath of fresh air because you were not bitter. You were not mad. 
you left very ladylike. And no, your love wasn't there or whatnot. But I can say this for sure. You are ready to love. Like you are really one of the few that are really ready to love. So I hope your king finds you really soon and stuff. Thank and we'll be you, hearing more great things from Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. And um, just a couple of things, you know, if people want to follow me, I'm on Instagram as Liba Nation. I'm also on uh, TikTok and YouTube as Liba Nation. I don't have great followings. I ain't looking to be viral, nothing like that. Um, but I mentioned this before. I have a video with the day after the mixer. I am in my bed. I don't have no makeup on. My voice sounds, you know, real low. But I talk about my experience and, the, you know, what happened. So I'm in the middle of editing it, but I'm going to be dropping this soon. So I'll let y'all know when I did, but when I do. But I just wanted to give you all the heads up about that. So Awesome. I like it. I'm going to put it here right quick so they can find you. Make sure I got it right. Thank you so much. And thank you. This was wonderful. I enjoyed um, this experience, you all. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation. And thank you to all the people in the chat. I didn't get to read everything, but thank you for, <laughs> for watching. No, the ladies have been great tonight in the chat. They've been asking all kinds of questions. They love your presence. You say you're so beautiful. Thank and of course, you. my co-host, he's been doing his thing. Thank you, Sean and stuff. Sorry we started without you a little bit, but you're here. <laughs> I didn't oh, want to hold her up too long. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It was great. You know, it was really great getting to know you, Libba, and for sharing and being transparent with us. Um, you know, for everybody watching, um, you know, that's not on the live, you know, please, you know, follow Libba at Libba Nation. Um, check her out. See what she's doing. She's got some fun posts. I got a chance to just get a little sneak preview, you know, of your, your Instagram, and it is chock full of fun. So, you know, I would encourage you. everyone to to follow her and continue to watch her on her her quest for love. Yes. yes, and listen, if you know somebody, or if you are that somebody, please holler at a sister. But if you're gonna come, come correct. Don't come with no foolery because I'm gonna let you know. <laughs> and, and do come with some kids already, or you be willing to adopt. That's all we got to say. No, I'll be ready. Look, I don't mind. I don't mind you being older. Like if you if you about to retire, you got a good. You know, I'm cool with that too. So you don't have to have any kids. Or if you don't want kids and you want to haul at me, do that too. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> Just don't look for living to have none, baby. <laughs> I'm done. It's a wrap. Done, Donna. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And again, everybody that's watching and following, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure you guys go follow Sean on Filter because he has some stuff for the men over there. And again, thank you guys for all tuning in to another round. This has been another great session. And Libba, again, I want to thank you one time because you are our very, very, very first uh interview on this channel so i really appreciate you yes you are on this channel you are <laughs> well, i hope i broke the mold honey listen they better you did come on number two three four, the bar five. is here now so everybody better come with this energy <laughs> they better come with this energy <laughs> thank you sweetie i appreciate right, you so much you. Bye, Sean, bye libba <laughs> we appreciate you Likewise. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.